Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So today's topic of today's our topic is cardiomyopathy and pericardial diseases. This is uh, such a huge topic, both of them. Uh, it cannot be covered in a single lecture. And every uh, these two topics have further classification of severe many more diseases like in cardiomyopathy you will have congenital cardiomyopathy acquired by cardiomyopathy and there is a huge list in cardiomyopathy and same in uh, pericardial effusion pericardial diseases in pericardial diseases we have uh, pericardial uh, pericarditis pericardial effusion and then constrictive pericarditis there are many more diseases which cannot be each of each single topic of that needs uh, one hour of lecture. So uh, I will try my level best to cover, uh, to give an overview uh, regarding both of these diseases. So let's start with cardiomyopathy. So cardiomyopathy is like heart failure. Let's have definition of heart failure. This is according to AHA ACC a definition of heart failure, which is uh, a heart failure is a complex syndrome. It's not a disease. It's a syndrome that results from a structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection of blood. The heart, the heart itself has only two function. That is, number one, it has to receive blood from peripheries, both uh, upper extremities as well as lower extremities. One function. The other function is to eject the blood that comes into it. So it receives blood and it ejects the blood. If there is any structural or functional impairment that fails uh, ventricular filling or ejection of blood is called heart failure. So uh, this is a pictorial diagram in which the normal heart has been shown as well as the heart with enlarged, uh, enlarged heart. So that is heart failure. And the symptoms usually these people have suffocation and then fluid overload both and you can see both in lungs as well as in peripheries you look at the periphery of the patient uh, that it has swollen up and cyanotic so causes of heart failure heart failure has a etiology or causes of a huge list that it may be due to congenital heart disease it may be due to mi or ischemic heart disease, it may be due to valvular heart disease, pericardial heart disease can lead to heart failure or cardiomyopathy. And arrhythmogenic cause of cardiomyopathy, certain arrhythmias can cause uh, heart failure. Hypertension, what of one of the most common disease, it ultimately leads to hypertrophic heart disease and then uh, some endocrinal issues some endocrinal diseases can lead to heart failure of course infection uh, can lead to heart disease the most common of it is coxsackie virus that leads to uh, myocarditis and heart failure anemia anemia can lead to heart failure and chemotherapy as well as radiotherapy can lead to heart failure of course, drug overuse and alcohol uh, alcohol can lead to or ethanol abuse can lead to heart failure. These are the list, <laughs> some brief list of uh, uh, causes that leads to heart failure. So heart failure or cardiomyopathy or heart failure is classified, previously classified into many uh, different ways like it was classified as a left-sided heart failure or right-sided heart failure then it comes that uh, systolic heart failure or diastolic heart failure so uh, there are many ways to classify the heart failure but the most recent of it is uh, heart failure uh, with reduced ejection fraction 
and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction these two these this this is the classification that has been described in aha acc guidelines back in 2013 and this is the most recent classification of heart failure and it describes all previous uh, classification of heart failure as well so if you try to understand these two types of heart failure you will learn that how uh, things goes on so uh, heart failure with preserved fraction fraction means that if a patient develops symptoms of heart failure uh, whose ejection fraction is more than 40 percent it comes into classification of heart uh, heart failure with reserve ejection fraction preserved ejection fraction if the patient is having symptoms of heart failure and the ejection fraction is less than 40 percent it comes into category of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so uh this uh, classification, I told you that if you try to understand this classification, it defines or it collaborates with previous classifications as well. So heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is also called as heart failure with uh, systolic heart failure and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is also called as uh, diastolic heart failure. But right now at the moment, uh i will uh, ask you people to obsolete uh, from your memory that uh, that that terminology that is systolic heart failure diastolic heart failure right sided heart failure left sided heart failure i um, uh, i know that you have come through this topic from uh, in your pathology but clinically you should only memorize this, uh, the, these two categories that is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with preserved rejection fraction and you should have the idea of cutoff value when we should call it preserved heart failure when when it, we should call it uh, reserve uh, uh, reduced heart failure so anyone who has ejection fraction of 40 or 40 percent or more comes into category of preserved rejection fraction and anyone who, who has ejection fraction of uh, less than 40 percent uh, falls into the category of reduced ejection fraction so this is the uh, pictorial slide which shows the heart with normal uh, morphology and on the uh, left side of the screen you can see the heart dilated heart dilated heart the muscle uh, the muscle wall is thin out so this uh, this is uh, mostly uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. So cardiomyopathy, uh, usually uh, it can be acquired or it can be familial. Uh, as I uh, gives you the etiology of the uh, cardiomyopathy. So this is the weakening uh, of uh, muscle wall. Cardio means heart, myo means muscle and pathy means uh, pathology so anything that alters the function of the heart comes into category of cardiomyopathy so usually in this category the heart muscle can be uh, hypertrophied the heart muscles can be uh, thin out and the heart can be dilated and the heart usually gets enlarged so symptoms the cardinal symptoms of any cardiac disease, uh, you should uh, you only memorize the three symptoms, that is shortness of breath, chest pain, and palpitation. These three are cardinal symptoms, cardinal uh, symptoms of any heart disease. So in cardiomyopathy, the most pronounced uh, symptoms is shortness of breath. Usually patients with heart failure have shortness of breath because the heart is unable to get uh, eject the blood which comes into it and that blood doesn't go into lungs and that's why oxygenation doesn't take place and patient gets shortness of breath. The, the other thing in heart failure, uh, you will have symptoms of fatigue or easy fatigability. 
patient usually doesn't have energy uh, to carry on to carry out his uh, livings. Number three, these patients usually have fluid overload. So the blood, as I told you that the uh, the definition definition of heart failure that it has two functions that it receives blood and eject blood if the heart's unable to receive the blood so the fluid accumulates uh, where it has to be received from where it has to be received so usually a right side of the heart receives blood from lower extremities lower extremities mainly it receives also blood from upper extremities but in upper extremities due to gravity it ultimately 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 comes into a uh, right side of the heart but in lower extremity has it go it has to go against the gravity so in in heart failure uh, the usually the fluid gets accumulate in lower extremities in abdomen uh, and the patient may have joined us due to congestion of liver the patient may have ascites the patient may have severe lower limb edema or uh, ankle edema so these are the uh, pictorial slide which shows a different geometry of heart in heart failure that is in hypertrophic and hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy usually the muscles get so much thickened and that it uh, makes an impairment in uh, receiving of blood so the the patient won't be able the, the heart won't be able to receive the blood that comes into it in uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy although the geometry doesn't change that much but it is a disease of cardiomyocytes that uh, enables to get a stretch so uh, in this disease also the heart is unable to receive uh, the blood and the uh, in the last one that is dilated cardiomyopathy the heart muscles get thin out and it gets dilated and it doesn't have that strength to eject the blood that comes into it so these are some potential causes that uh, that leads to uh, dilated cardiomyopathy or heart failure uh, which uh, previously have been discussed that is number one in acquired required causes of heart failure the coronary artery disease is the top most cause of it Cor coronary artery disease and the next common cause is hypertension so if we able to treat coronary artery disease and hypertension we uh, get rid of large bulk of the patient with heart failure or we can prevent uh, the largest number of heart failure so coronary artery disease hypertension uh, nutritional deficiency that is by, by especially vitamin b1 uh, can lead to heart failure certain nutritional deficiency can lead to heart failure in pregnancy uh, some people uh, some uh, females can have heart failure which is uh, termed as uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy infectious infections can lead to heart failure alcohol and many drugs can lead to heart failure of course valvular heart disease is one of the uh, common cause of heart failure and autoimmune disease as well now uh, in restrictive heart these are the some lists of uh, diseases that leads to restrictive cardiomyopathy in restrictive cardiomyopathy as i uh, said that the heart won't be able to receive blood so in this uh, disease usually edema can occurs and fluid overload get occurs in all over the body Amyloid, amyloidosis it's one of the disease uh, in which uh, abnormal protein gets deposits everywhere in the body and it also gets deposits in uh, cardiomyocytes and ultimately leads to uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy Connective tissue disease or connective tissue disorders can lead to uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Hemochromatosis, in which a uh, large amount of iron uh, gets deposited 
in cardiomyocytes and then uh, abnormality in cardiomyocytes occurs and the heart won't be able to stretch out or receive the blood that uh, needs to come to it. And sarcoidosis is one of the disease. Uh, it's also inflammatory or autoimmune disease that ultimately leads to restrictive cardiomyopathy. Of course, there are uh, radio, uh, radiations and chemotherapy can lead to restrictive heart failure or restrictive cardiomyopathy. So these are some risk factors that leads to heart failure or uh, cardiomyopathy. That is, uh, I discussed health and healthy diet, hypertension, abnormal cholesterol that leads to coronary artery disease and ultimately called uh, uh, heart failure, diabetes mellitus, obesity, excessive use of alcohol, smoking, these all is uh, these all are the risk factors that ultimately leads to heart failure. The w w recently the one of the risk factors or common cause of uh, cardiac disease is a stress. What does a stress does? A stress uh, in remaining in stress for a long time, uh, your hormonal disturbance occurs. Uh, person can remain in uh, catecholaminergic surge. In this surge, what happens, uh, you remain in tachycardia for a long time and tachycardia itself can lead to heart failure. And in stress, certain hormones releases and that hormones are toxic to the heart and leads to heart failure. So stress is one of the uh, risk factors that is recently uh, found out to be uh, cause of heart failure or cardiomyopathy. So how do we diagnose heart failure? Uh, the diagnosis, usually it is clinical syndrome. So uh, this is the uh, clinical, uh, you, you diagnose it clinically. And then uh, there are certain tests or diagnostic criteria that leads to your diagnosis. The gold standard uh, diagnostic test for heart failure is echocardiogram or echocardiography. That leads to that, that leads, that not only tells you uh, how much heart failure is, but also can tell you the cause of heart failure and which type of heart failure it is. So uh, echocardiogram is gold standard test for uh, diagnose, diagnosis of heart failure. Other tells, other, other, there are other tests that supplements that, which are uh, chest X-ray. In chest X-ray, what you get, you can get uh, enlarged heart. And uh, there are other tests you can have uh, ECG. What uh, you get in ECG, you in ECG, you get, uh, I, I will try to answer all, whatever questions you people have, uh, write it down. I will uh, try to answer in the end of the lecture. Uh, so chest X-ray, in chest X-ray, you may have uh, enlarged cardiothoracic ratio. And in ECG, you may get a widening of QRS or broad complex, or you may get Q waves you may get a poor progression of uh, R wave in precordial leads. So what are the treatment for uh, heart failure or cardiomyopathy? Basically, uh, there are some uh, supplementary treatment or supportive treatment and some uh, definitive treatment. Definite treatment is whatever the cause is, treat that cause. And supportive treatment, uh, uh, you want to not have so much exertion. So exertion should be avoided. And they are asked to have low sight, uh, low salt and uh, take uh, lesser amount of fluids and we do we do have medical treatment for that is diuretics and digoxin uh, we can have uh, we can use vasodilator that is ace inhibitor arbs 
and then spironolactone is being used if uh, it is due to nutritional deficiency uh, so b uh, beta 1 can be used or vitamin b1 can be used and the other thing uh, we can use beta blocker uh, for heart failure as well now the definite the definitive treatment of heart failure is treat the cause if it is due to uh, ischemic heart disease and it can be the uh, heart failures there are certain types of heart failure which can be reversible and there are some types of heart failure uh, which cannot be reversible or it is permanent so you must have an idea that which type of heart failure is reversible peripartum cardiomyopathy is reversible uh, iron uh, sorry that is uh, Heart failure due to iron overload can be uh, reversible. Heart failure due to tachycardia induced heart failure is reversible. So if you treat the cause, uh, heart failure can be treated and patient can have normal ejection fraction and normal heart without uh, any medication. But if it is permanent or it is irreversible, patient uh, has developed a stage of irreversible heart failure that he has to remain uh in medical treatment lifelong or uh, he may have he may have device treatment so the other options beside medical treatment we do have surgery in cer certain uh types of heart failure that is uh if it is due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy myomectomy is recommended and if it is uh, the other treatment we do have device treatment that is there are devices which helps in heart failure and the other thing is uh, in end stage heart failure we can transplant heart we we do have legacy of heart transplant so uh, we do hand uh, here with heart failure or cardiomyopathy now the other topic is pericardial diseases so in pericardial disease uh, i would like to uh, have go through with you this one of the very uh, common or most important topic in pericardial diseases pericardial effusion pericardium before going to learn this disease or to go through this disease, you must have an idea that what is uh, precardium. Precardium, pericardium is a, a serious layer, which is of uh, two layer. That is one layer is attached to the heart is called visceral. The other is uh, in the peripheral, which is called peripheral layer. So in between these two layer, there's a, uh, a space which is called pericardial space in this pericardial space there is minimal amount of fluid that is present there uh, to reduce the friction to reduce the friction if uh, this uh, that amount is about 50 ml of fluid if that amount if it it has the potency to accommodate uh, fluid as much as two liters so if the fluids gets uh, accumulated there and so it impairs with the heart functioning that is its dilatation to receive the blood and its contraction the that may lead to heart failure and uh, it may get uh, impairment with body function so what are the causes of pericardial effusion pericardial effusion uh, it can be primarily uh, due to infection of uh, myocardial infection. It can be post-surgical. It can be uh, due to trauma or any tumor that spreads there. And can, it, can, it may lead to pericardial effusion. And then uh, in renal failure, we do have a pericardial effusion. In hypothyroidism, autoimmune disease, these are the some known uh causes that ultimately leads to pericardial inflammation and pericardial effusion so what does uh, what symptoms do uh, patient have with pericardial effusion the symptoms would be uh, shortness of breath and chest pain shortness of breath chest pain and fatigability these 
the symptoms for cardiac disease, I, as I mentioned previously, is only three. That is chest pain, shortness of breath, and palpitation. These three symptoms patient may have, but in certain disease, you should look for other symptoms. In this, if the pericardial effusion is due to infectious disease, patient may have fever, patient may have muscle ache or body ache. So these are the symptoms. Main, but main symptoms is shortness of breath, palpitation, and EC fatigability. This is the chest X-ray of the patient with huge uh, pericardial effusion. And it shows that enlarged, very enlarged uh, cardiothoracic ratio. So this is, it's been uh, huge pericardial effusion. You will come across chest X-ray like this. Now, uh, what do you have in uh, on ECG? In ECG, the first thing you will get is low voltage ECG. What is low voltage ECG? The QRS complex would be uh, less than five mm. Uh, so you can see here in in limb lead there are uh, low complex voltages. The other thing is. Uh, you will get a pulses alternance. What is pulses alternance? Pulses alternance is there would be variation in QRS complexes. So you can see that QRS complex one is uh, try to look at lead number two, then you will uh, understand from the first complex. QRS complex is large, then the second complex is uh, small, then the third complex is big and the fourth complex is small so this is one pulse is uh, one pulse show large qrs complex and the other pulse show small qrs complex this is called pulses alternance pulses alternance and this is uh, one of the cardinal symptoms of large pericardial effusion if you get this uh, so it is definite that patient is having uh, pericardial effusion the other thing you may get tachycardia and uh, you, uh, of course, I told you about uh, low voltage ECG. So what are the treatment for pericardial effusion? Uh, pericardial effusion, uh, usually uh, it depends on uh, how much amount of pericardial fluid is present, number one. And what is, uh, what is, uh, either it is acute or chronic. If it is acute, only 50 ml or 100 ml of fluid can make uh, condition life-threatening. And you don't have choice for that. You just need to uh, go to pericardial space and take out the fluid. If it is chronic, even two liters or one liter of fluid doesn't make an issue. So it is uh, the treatment depends on chronicity of the con uh, chronicity of the condition and the amount of the fluid present into it. So uh, here it is mentioned that it, uh, here is the treatment for inflammation of heart. That is, if the pericardial uh, fluid is due to uh, inflammation. So you what you can use is you can use uh, NSAIDs and you can use uh, prednisolone or a steroid, and you may get use colchicine. This is not the treatment for pericardial effusion, uh, but this is the treatment for inflammation of the heart. If the pericardial fluid is present or it accumulated due to inflammation, then you can use these drugs. The, the, these, uh, this is the slide which shows, uh, if you go one by one with me, each uh, subcategory of the slide, so you may understand that. In uh, left top of the screen, what you can get is, if pericardial fluid, this is the, peri uh, in the left most common, most left uh, side of the screen shows heart with uh, normal pericardium and on the right, blood pool out and it uh, accumulates the heart. So if it can be an emergency, it can be emer an emergency if it develops acutely. 
or uh, if it gets accumulated chronically then it is not an emergency you can have you you do have time you do uh, you may need uh, you may have you can treat the condition with medical treatment and then you decide for any intervention so how do uh, you get it uh, how do you get it uh, that either it is an emergency or not it depends on the vitals of the pressure if patient is vitally unstable then you don't have time you what you need is just go into pericardial space and take out the fluid so there are some uh, criteria uh, which shows that patient have emergency or patient may uh, get into uh, trouble if you don't take it out the fluid which is in pericardial space the, the most common is that is back striate back striate which you can see in the left side lower uh, picture the back striate is uh, low blood pressure distended neck veins or distended jugular veins and muffled heart sound if you get all these three this is called back striate uh, back striate and this is one of the medical emergency what you need to do is you need to uh go into pericardial space and take out the fluid so acutely pericardial fluid can accumulate if you see the right side uh, lower most uh, picture in acute pericardial uh, fluid accumulation is a medical emergency uh, that can be accumulated uh, by chest trauma or rupture of aorta or aortic dissection and rupture of ventricular wall these three conditions in which pericardial uh, fluid gets accumulated acutely and what you need to do is you need emergently uh, go into pericardial space and take out the fluid what is cardiac tamponade cardiac tamponade is uh, that the pericardial fluid is so much that it doesn't allow the heart muscles to dilate and get the fluid from the perif peripheries so this is a cardiac emergency and it's a certain uh, Pericardial synthesis means take out the fluid from the pericardial species, the space. And if you unable to go, this is this is percutaneous procedure, and you uh, usually we go through a zephoid process. Zephy is below the zephy sternal uh, area, go into the pericardial space and uh, draw the blood. If we unable to go from that place, uh, what we need to do is we we can go from intercostal space into the heart and take out the fluid. If we fail to go percutaneously, if you fail if we fail to go percutaneously to uh, this uh, percutaneously to pericardial space, then surgical uh, treatment is uh, indicated that is pericardiotomy or pericardial window and pericardiotomy what we uh, do is we take out the pericardial uh, layer and pericardial fluid by with in general anesthesia after having incision in uh, after having incision in chest so pericardial window we make a window this, this is also a surgical procedure procedure a window uh, can be made and to drain the fluid So this is the diagram which shows uh, that uh, through uh, 16 or 18 gauge needle, uh, how to go into pericardial space and draw the fluid from pericardial sac. Thank you. If now you can have your questions and if you want to.
if you have any questions let me know i will try to answer you sir like atherosclerosis are these risk factors divided into murder atherosclerosis this is this comes into heading of ischemic heart disease in ischemic heart disease uh, of course uh, you have modifiable risk factors or non modifiable risk factors but this is a separate uh, entity uh, it should be discussed in uh, ischemic heart disease topic so uh, ultimately of course ischemic heart disease or atherosclerosis can lead to ischemic heart disease and ischemic heart disease can lead to into a uh, heart failure this is one of the risk factors or cause of heart failure muffled heart sound muffled heart sound means low heart sounds you won't be able to listen the heart sounds because the fluid comes in between now the heart sounds the the fluid in between the heart and your stethoscope uh then between the heart and the stethoscope uh what it does it gets impairment in conduction of the sound so you won't be able to listen the heart sound and the terminology used for it is muffled heart sound the cardinal symptoms for pericardial effusion is shortness of breath a uh, patient have shortness of breath uh, and uh, easy fatigability tachycardia or palpitation these are the cardinal symptoms for pericardial effusion because uh, the causes of heart failure is a uh, huge we do the most common uh, cardiovascular disease is hypertension and the most the other is ischemic heart disease so we have a huge bulk of the disease huge bulk of disease with heart with uh, ischemic heart disease and hypertension both of these can lead to heart failure so uh, heart failure is a uh, we do have huge number of patients with half heart, uh, heart failure i don't have uh, exact exact uh, statistics of that but uh, we do we do across uh, we do come across patient with heart failure in huge amount so the, the daily the, on daily basis we come across three or five patient with cardiomyopathy or heart failure uh back try backs uh try it can be explained that you know as i told you that heart has only two functions that is heart heart is only two function that it has to receive the blood from peripheries and the other thing it has to eject the blood that comes into it in pericardial effusion if there is large amount of pericardial fluid in uh, so what it causes it doesn't uh, allow the heart to expand so if the heart if the heart muscle unable to expand it fails to receive the blood so what happens if it fails to receive the blood the blood gets accumulated in peripheries so neck veins the, in from the neck veins the heart is unable to receive the blood so neck veins get engorged or distended so number one the other thing if the heart is unable to receive the blood so it won't be it won't be able to eject the blood if it unable to receive the blood how can it eject it what it what it can eject so if it is unable to eject the blood so what happens the blood pressure gets lower down number two so two of the tri aid is the neck veins get distended blood pressure gets lower down the third one there is usually you hear with your stethoscope the heart sound but now what happens a fluid comes in between your heart and your stethoscope the, the other thing comes in between your heart and stethoscope so you won't be able